Good evening from Plug It Studios. I'm Scott. I'm Abram. And we are here with uh, episode 483 of F5 Live, Refreshing Technology, for uh, November 5th, 2017, a proud part of the Tech Podcast Network. If it's tech, it's here. This week, Microsoft is looking to the future, World of Warcraft is going back to the past, and podcasts are finally safe. This here is F5 Live, Refreshing Technology, the flagship show on the Plug It's Live family of content. And uh, wherever you are and however you are accessing our show, whether it be Facebook, Apple Podcasts, Google Play Music Podcasts, the Podcast Play app in the Windows Store on our uh, homes on live stream, <clears throat> um, Periscope, Mixer, or um, Twitch, or of course on our apps pluggitslive.com slash apps. Thank you for making us a part of your day. Um, and there are two ways that you can do that. You can join us live on Sunday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern by going to f5live.tv slash join us. There you can chat with us uh, in the chat room live during the show. Let us know your take on the topics as we talk about them. Avram and I always love to hear about uh, your input on the topics, including uh, especially on the pilch point which will be on a little bit we'll be talking about uh, a couple of things um we'll be talking about uh bloatware on uh on windows and um a laptop that he has sitting next to him um so we love to get your input so definitely feel free to chat with us there but if you can't join us live that is okay you can also um subscribe to our shows by going to uh, plughitslive.com slash subscribe. There you will see all of our series, including F5 Live, The Pilch Point, our special events feed, which is um, about to have some content in it. Uh, the 3000 Brigade podcast, which we will be doing a new episode of next week. Um, there will be a new um, Toad Detective episode next week, uh, live from Anime EY, which we're very excited about. If you have not listened to the last one, you've got to go listen to it. It is so unbelievably funny. Um, Jason and Aaron did a really great job of putting that together. Uh, and then, of course, we've got other series there as well, all with content um, being produced at regular intervals. We've got some new ideas, uh, and especially for first looks, which, you know, kind of bounces around throughout the year. We've got some ideas to keep that going all year long. So uh, keep a lookout for that as well. And I think with that, that is the spiel. Abram. How have you been this week? Not bad, not bad. I had a nice Halloween. It was uh, it was fun. We've had a lot of new uh, laptops coming to the office. Right now, it's raining laptops in our <laughs> office. We we can't test and review them fast enough because companies are just sending us now stuff that is coming out for the holiday season, and we're pretty much getting into the holiday season already. Yeah. Uh, so we got a lot of stuff reviews that are we put up and a lot that are going up uh so a lot of a lot of laptop testing and editing and reviewing uh going on and uh you know it's uh it's just been an, an interesting time we saw a couple of really cool products in the office that i'm not going to talk about in detail tonight sure. but uh i recommend everyone go to tom's guide and read my colleague sheree smith's reviews of the uh mixed reality acer headset yes. and of the uh and of the Star Wars Jedi Challenges augmented reality uh, set, which is pretty cool. You get to like lightsaber duel against like Darth Maul and other AR characters in your living room. The, so the thing that we wanted from day one when Nintendo announced the Wii. Yeah, <laughs> no, it, yeah. Now it has its. The characters are very translucent, uh -huh. so. So that's kind of a downer. Um, you know, it's not like total, they're not they're in your living room, but it's very easy to see through them. So it, it could be a little better, uh, but it's still a pretty awesome experience. And I encourage people to check out our, our review and video about that on Tom's Guide. I uh, I enjoyed seeing the uh, the the Acer review. The uh, the most interesting thing that we did with Acer actually is not the review of it, but my colleague Andrew Friedman decided yes. what would it be like to work for a day uh, 
using Microsoft Mixed Reality platform. Like, although Mixed Reality is kind of a misnomer since it's really just VR. There's no there's no augmented reality involved. But, um, you know, if you've tried the headsets, which few people have at this point, you know that the UI is you're in a cliff house. It's like a fancy, fancy house like Tony Stark has in Iron Man three uh-huh. or something. And you know, and you're walking through, and each app is like on hung up like a picture on a wall the window for each app uh and microsoft says hey we've got productivity here you can do any apps you want so he he tried to work like you know do the standard things write articles uh you know edit images and photoshop whatever um send emails chat with us on instant messaging uh for the whole day with that thing on his head um and he managed he was and uh oh, uh, there, there's our sixty second pause from Avram. Um, <clears throat> I I actually read this this article, and I'll tell you that uh, he has a disclaimer like right up front. Oh, there you go. Welcome back. It's it's every time. Every, I know. Like fifteen <laughs> minutes into our call, every time. Anyway, so. So he managed, and he wrote an article about it. And I like, uh, I liked the disclaimer he, at the top. Don't do this. Yeah. Yes. The, you we don't, did it, so you, you don't, don't want to do to. this. <laughs> oh, you don't want to. There's. A, I didn't want to. There's a call back to a to a slogan for the show from long ago. We did it, so you don't have to. Yes. There you go. <laughs> well, you know he, you know that's one that uh, you know. I think if I did it for a few minutes, I'd get ill trying to, to like work in that environment. Yeah, but for sure. Good, good for him. I mean, he even typed on a real keyboard. That's a testament to his good touch typing skills. Yes, indeed. Because yeah. you can't see your hands. Yeah, you're you're yeah. totally secluded. That's oh yeah. well. Congratulations to him for not uh, raging and destroying everything around him like Godzilla. I told him when he proposed the story that, like, you don't have to, to do this all day. You could just try it for an hour or something. And he's like, no, I'm, I'm committed he, to this. He's committed. He totally committed. I, I got to give him a lot of props for that. He really committed. <laughs> I like and him. he was able to write the article while using it. Like, oh, so fascinating. Great. I like so I him. He's a lot of fun. Check that article out on Laptop Mag. <laughs> he is an interesting character. Um, I guess while we're talking about reviews, um, we've got some new ones coming up this week as well on PlugItsLive.com. So uh, uh, there's one that was posted a little while ago, about an hour and a half ago, um, for a, a game called Settled, which will make you not so much. Uh, de- definitely go check that out. We'll have some more uh, throughout the week, maybe even some more uh, tomorrow. So um, you you mentioned Halloween. Was uh, Was Halloween good for you and the family? Yeah, yeah, we, they do Halloween really nicely in this neighborhood. We okay. walk around. A lot of families make a big deal and have like big, big displays in the front of their front yard and all kinds of stuff. And so, that's cool. Uh, so, so it was cool. You know, my Isaac, my son, uh, dressed up as uh, Gecko, which is not, which is his favorite character on the show, cartoon PJ Masks, which only parents of young children who watch Disney Junior would know. <laughs> Um, I could not get a matching costume because they don't make too many costumes for adults that for this kid's show. Sure. Uh, so I went as Batman. Though, and, it, though uh, it seems like maybe they should for that reason. Yes, they should. They should. I think I saw some on Etsy or whatever. Very expensive. So understood. You know. But he told me next year we can go as Star Wars, uh, Star Wars characters. So, okay. So we have a better, better shot for that. But, very nice. Uh, we we love Halloween here. It's like our favorite holiday of all. So uh, so I I took the day off for that. That's like my my favorite holiday all year. <laughs> nice. I did not have a single trick or treater, which made me sad. Although it did mean that all the candy was mine. So I mean, there's I guess there's an upside to it. But yeah, we didn't have a single trick or treater here, and I was uh, I was pretty disappointed because I saw I saw kids outside, but I talked. To people in the in the complex, and they're like, "No, there was nothing." So, I didn't see any costumes. It made me sad. <laughs> it depends where you, it obviously depends where you live. Like in my parents' neighborhood, they get no trick or treaters. Um, and you know, when I lived in an apartment, I got no trick or treaters. 
Gotcha. Oh yeah, I keep forgetting that you're in the house now. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> that just totally. I've still got it in my head that you're in the old place. Anyway, that's okay. Um, yeah. So um, I guess the other thing that's going on around here is that we are in the process of uh, kind of rebuilding the studio. So if <laughs> if you see us post weird videos and things on uh, on Facebook or anything like that. We are retesting technology after um, after making some some changes here. So I apologize in advance. Uh, <laughs> with that, let's get down to some news. This week's Nifty Gifties on F5 Live is proudly powered by the Microsoft Store. We were just talking about Windows Mixed Reality and the headsets are here. Um, you can see the, the full lineup, whether it be the Acer one that we were talking about before or uh, pre-ordering the, the Samsung HMD right now. Um, they're, they're all available, plus of course, non-mixed reality stuff, right? The uh, Surface Laptop, the Surface Pro, the Surface Book 2, um, all the specs and uh, ordering information available, plus the Xbox One X, pre-order available now as well. Uh, this holiday obviously is going to be big for, uh, for new Microsoft and Microsoft partner hardware. Um, plus, you can save money on, if you're not looking for the Xbox One X, you, you don't want the 4K, um, it's okay. Uh, you can still purchase the Xbox One S um, with 30 bucks off, plus extra free games, and of course, uh, all of the other stuff that you would expect. Office 365 um, and uh, the Oculus, no, not the Oculus, the HTC Vive, and a bunch of other stuff, plus, of course, laptops and phones. All available by going to f5live.tv slash Microsoft. I can't remember if Oculus is on there too. <laughs> That's okay. All right. Um, so speaking of Microsoft and mixed reality, that's apparently going to be a bit of a thing tonight. Uh, the uh, the device that that started their ambitions. We all remember the surprise announcement of the Hololens um, at the at the tail end of a completely unrelated event. They pulled an apple and did, uh, by the way, one more thing, and <laughs> they showed off the HoloLens to everybody's surprise. And um, since then, obviously, a lot of things have happened. There's, what, five different additional mixed reality headsets. Um, but, of course, the HoloLens is kind of special, right? It's, uh, it's standalone. It's see-through, so... It's it's very different than the other guys in the in the lot, but it's also the like the least available. It's way more expensive than anything else in the in the set. It's technically still in developer edition mode. It's like it's a totally different class from everything else. But that is partially because um, it is Microsoft's mixed reality hardware playground like that's the place where they mess around with technology in the same way that the original surface pro wasn't necessarily launched as a as an attempt for microsoft to make a big splash they they weren't against the idea of being successful in the in the the computer business but it wasn't their intent it was more like what intel does uh with their their spec hardware they wanted to challenge the industry and with the surface it absolutely worked um the the form factors of computers changed hugely um and then so with with hololens it's kind of the same thing it's a bit of a playground for them uh there's a second generation that's being being played with internally that includes a piece of hardware that's kind of cool it is an ai chip um that allows that will allow the hololens when it's not got internet access and can't connect to azure to do some of the the ai components it's basically like an azure on a chip it's there's a 
an earlier version of it that's on a micro uh, microprocessor board right now on a like a developer board that I saw at a developer event like two weeks ago, and uh, this is like the, the this will be like the grown up version of it. But the thing that that Microsoft said about it that I really liked was once we're confident with this chip, we want it out there. Like we're not just building it for ourselves. We want the industry to enhance their devices with this. So obviously, who knows where that might come in handy. But, you know, if your laptop, you're not online, you're on the on the train headed to or from work. Right. Like like Avram uh, does every day. Um and maybe you are not online. You're not tethering your phone. You're, you know, whatever. You don't have internet access in a particular place. Maybe this AI chip could be in your laptop and get, continue to give you some of Cortana's capabilities without that connection. You know, things like that. There are there are some places where it could certainly be useful. Obviously, the headsets would be a great place for it, particularly the Hololens. Uh, but I I like the idea that computers could have it or that it could be incorporated into like standalone things uh, like like the board that I, I was uh, interacting with a week or two ago. So what I don't understand and maybe for the benefit for our audience, we could you could explain is sure. what what do you get out of having an AI chip? I mean, the things that Cortana that you couldn't get off of just having more thing, more data stored locally because a lot of the things that Cortana does, it has to reach out to the internet yeah. to help you, not because your computer can't handle the processing power. But because that's but where the data is. Because that's where the data is. And, sure. you know, it's not feasible to store all of the different possible responses that she might have to you on your local hard drive or SSD. And they're constantly changing and adding them and things like that. And, Absolutely. you know, and, and of course, the internet. Like, you know, you're not going to, I mean, there is such a thing I think is offline Wikipedia that is used by some institutions or whatever, but you know, you can't really replicate the inner, you know, short of caching a whole bunch of web pages, you can't really, you know, re replicate the internet without an internet connection. So what is it you would get out of this AI chip? That's that, that those are all, uh, very valid points. The consumer facing side of Cortana is absolutely very internet dependent. And there'd be very little that 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 aspect of her, the search bar in the bottom corner, the ability to, hey, Cortana, what's the temperature? Obviously, she's not going to be able to give you any of that information without an internet connection or a device that she could ask uh, for temperature information within uh, short range. Um, but Cortana is more than the little search box in the, the corner on Windows 10. Um, uh, the, the Cortana name and system is the overarching uh, brand for all of Microsoft's um, artificial intelligence uh, APIs. So, so even like as a developer, if you wanted to build a thing that s was constantly ingesting uh, spreadsheets from your uh, your corporate system, right? Um, this would give the ability, like if, if you, while you're working on spreadsheet stuff, or uh, you could have an AI powered system behind the scenes that's constantly working with that data to make decisions as you're building. And that stuff currently requires Cortana access, which means uh, web access, access to Azure, but this would bring those kinds of capabilities down to the device. Now, we don't know exactly what stuff they want to build into this chip, but the ability to do um, like neural network processing um, and stuff like that, the Azure machine learning stuff, all of that currently requires Azure access um, for Cortana to be able to pull that stuff off. Maybe uh, the new, the, the, the little first gen chip that I saw a week or so ago has the beginnings of that on it so that maybe uh, 
like in that case, maybe you could build it into um, like a standalone communication device or things like that. Um, I have a device that I'm going to be doing a review on this week that you put an SD card into and it backs up your drive. Well, with an AI chip, the ability to determine, uh, to learn what types of files transfer to this particular hard drive better and things like that, um, all of that takes processing power and being able to incorporate an AI chip and not have to use Azure would be nice. It may not be, it may not give a whole lot to you or I tomorrow, but as more apps start looking toward AI to make decisions and stuff based on your information, uh, even on your own system, I could see, I could see some value here. Yeah, I guess what I'm trying to understand, and, and time I guess will tell, is why you would need dedicated hardware to do that when we have more, we have pretty powerful CPUs in our systems right now, and software could definitely. I mean, why can't your x86 processor do AI? Um, it absolutely could, uh, but it would have to constantly be building and or rebuilding neural networks. Uh, whereas with a dedicated chip that would be able to hold that information um, cross cross boots, for example, um, without having to to dump to disk and come back, it's to be able to to hold the neural network itself and not have to keep uh, creating and destroying it um, between applications and stuff like that would massively speed up the capability. And then if you're incorporating it, like I said, like that board that I was using last week, um, in that kind of capability or like this this uh, drive copy or things like that, there's the ability to be able to not have to include extra software on the thing to be able to bring down so much of Azure's uh, AI stuff and have it just all solo on a chip and not have to have all that stuff out in the wild. It's better for Microsoft. It's easier for a hardware manufacturer to incorporate. Here you go. Here's everything that I need to be able to do the AI all in like just snap it into a board and go. It's, it's, it's good for Microsoft. It's good for the board developers um, to be able to bring that stuff down uh, without having to have extra software and stuff like that because the software itself could balloon the cost of the device in a way that having everything like SOC snap in and go uh, may not. So uh, it's, it's definitely an interesting idea. Uh, it's not the first uh, standalone AI chip. Um, Google has one that they use internally in their AI team, like in their AI servers. Microsoft has one that they built for, for Azure. Um, and then Google also has one that they're working on for consumer. Um, and then obviously outside of the big guys, there's probably dozens of others that are, that are working on them as well um, to, to make using their things easier is really when it comes down to from like a developer hardware or software developer standpoint, it's just to make integrating those things easier. So being able to do them offline. So I, I, the big thing that I like is that, that Microsoft, as opposed to like the, like the, the big difference between Apple and Microsoft, right? Apple has worked on an AI chip. They haven't talked about it a whole lot, but they've got one internally. Um, and they don't even need to really talk about it because it's an internal thing. But then, then there's Microsoft who's building this thing internally for their own headset. And they're like, you know what? We don't want to just enhance our stuff. We want everybody to be able to enhance their stuff. If, if you think this will make your life better, we want you to be able to use it, which I think is a really cool thing. It's definitely their MO lately um, with the, the most recent... Uh, surface pen the the technology that they that they developed the the asic asic the technology that makes the the pen so 
wonderful. Uh, they have licensed to other people. There are other companies using it. They developed it for themselves and then said, all right, um, other people, if, if you like this, uh, we can we can work with you to incorporate it. And I, I think that's a really cool thing. They want like they want to make the whole industry better, which is a thing that I like. As as a developer, that's kind of our thing too, right? We want to make the, the industry better and you and I work hard to to help consumers uh, navigate the industry. And I like that Microsoft is on that on that same page personally. So anyway, um, we have no idea what capabilities the thing will have. We have no idea when the thing will be done. They have not officially really announced HoloLens 2, which isn't what it'll be. It'll be the probably the release version of it as opposed to the developer version of it. But like they haven't really talked about it other than in, in this, this particular uh, interview uh, where they, they talked about this AI chip. I, and and I, like, I like the path they're going down. Let me ask you something. Why doesn't sure. Microsoft make it easier, or is it just a matter of nobody else wants to do it to make it for other companies to make a HoloLens? That's a fair question. I have the no mixed idea. reality headsets are nothing like the HoloLens. Right. For our for our audience benefit, the fact that it's called mixed reality is 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 Microsoft branding. It's not for real because there's no mix. It's virtual reality. Like mixed reality is supposed to be a mix of augmented and and virtual reality. It's just headset. Uh, you know, Oculus and Vive competitor. The HoloLens is something pretty unique in the world. I mean, I guess there are other companies trying to do something like it. Yeah. Like Meta, but you know, it's it works with Windows. It works really well. It costs thirty five hundred bucks. Uh-huh. I I have talked to Microsoft execs who said to me something like, you know, we you know we can't imagine bringing the price down. It costs so much to make this thing. We don't think anyone else could make it cheaper. I. I disagree with that assessment because Microsoft often makes things much more ex- hardware much more expensive than other other companies trying to do the same thing. Sure. So, you know, I don't know whether it's just a matter of other companies don't want to make a HoloLens competitor or Microsoft's not totally sharing all of the technology with them. But I guarantee you that if you asked Acer to that if Acer tried to make a HoloLens, it would cost half as much. Yeah. Like. Yeah, like if Microsoft worked with with Acer and Lenovo, you'd have you'd end up with three devices all with with HoloLens type capability at three price points and three, you know, you'd have your Acer one which would be Acer and you'd have your Lenovo, you'd have your Microsoft, and they'd all they'd all find a place in the market. I I totally agree. I don't know if Microsoft isn't comfortable enough with the technology yet. Or I, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, you know, it wouldn't be dirt cheap, but I could, you know, I could imagine Acer doing it for like fifteen hundred bucks, where Microsoft does it for thirty-five. Because if you look at the Surface, you know, the Surface Book and the Surface Pro, uh, well, there's nothing quite like the Surface Book on the market. But all the companies that have come out with their own sure. sort of take on the Surface Pro, a lot of them are like, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars cheaper. Yeah, not quite as nice. But hundreds of dollars cheaper to right. give you similar functionality. Sure, and you know that's that's the thing that you know you mentioned Acer. That's one of the things that Acer does, right? They they take an idea and they they find the the places where cuts can be made to make it less expensive. They're not, you know, they're not the gold star of the industry, but they've never. And I don't mean that as gold star because they were a crap <laughs> company, but. <laughs> Um, they, they they obviously like to talk about their high end products when I talk to them. But yes, sure. Acer is Acer is the best at making things that are good and sh- good and cheap. Yes, they they kind of own the the inexpensive computer market and yeah. have for a while. I mean, yeah. to be fair, they did buy what uh, the the two really low end ones, uh, Gateway and E Machine. E Machines. <laughs> So and Packard Bell too. Oh God! So they definitely <laughs> live in that space, and they're not yeah. like they're not ashamed of it. They know who they are, yeah. and they're yeah. they're good at it. And then Lenovo would come in and build a a product that would be a little sturdier. Yeah, yeah. I I I don't know. There's got to be a reason why they're not doing that with Hololens. I don't know what it is though. It would be an interesting conversation to have with Microsoft though.
This week's Pilch Point with Avram Pilch is proudly powered by Monster Products. The headphones on my head right now, the Monster Elements, available in full over ear, then on ear and in ear, plus a wide variety of other styles of headphones, whether you're looking for, uh, you know, in ear Bluetooth for working out or you're looking for, uh, you know, big headphones for, for home listening or you're looking for Bluetooth speakers from the tiny hotshot to the big monster blaster and everything in between, plus all the cables that you need to connect these and all of your other devices, whether it be HDMI or even power. Uh, monster has it all, and you can find out all of the products by going to f5live.tv slash monster. And of course, that music means that it is time for the Pilch Point with online editorial director of Laptop Magazine and Tom's Guide, Avram Pilch. Avram, hey. what, what have we got this week? We've got two things, right? Yes. Because you wrote an interesting piece. Yes. So it's an old story, but it hasn't changed a lot. Uh, and I wanted to comment on this. Uh, bloatware on your windows computer there's a lot of it still uh which some people are surprised to hear um you know i i wrote to an analyst that we often get commentary from and he said no one has asked me about bloatware for years it's not a problem anymore um whether or not it's a problem that's an interesting perspective uh Be because I, I that's the, because that's taking a, a position on not on its existence, but on the value of its existence. Oh, well, he, he's he's saying it doesn't exist. Oh, okay. I, I'm saying that it exists, but uh, but you can, but it's not as bad as people say. Sure. Uh, but you know, the volume of it is quite impressive. Uh, so one thing that it, Andrew Friedman, my colleague at at Laptop Mag and Tom's Guide. Uh, wrote about did a story about uh, earlier in the week was Windows Signature Edition, or actually officially referred to as Microsoft Signature Edition, but some people say Windows Signature Edition, and those are uh, laptops or or piece desktops that are sold with a uh, quote unquote cleaner uh, install of the operating system, which is supposed to be free of, you know, they don't use the word bloatware, but trialware and you know third-party toolbars and all these things. But unfortunately, what we found is that even laptops that have come with this quote-unquote signature edition on board, which is every laptop that you buy at the Microsoft store and several laptops that are sold by other companies, such as Asus and Lenovo, sell things through their own uh, other channels that are like all ThinkPads now, I think, are signature edition. Um, it doesn't really do much for you. So the reason it doesn't do much for you is most of the bloatware on computers today, I'm sorry to say is put there by Microsoft and is there on signature edition and not signature edition. It's there across the board. So um, if you buy a new computer today, you will find at least 10 or 11 pieces of bloatware on there before you see the ones that Microsoft, before you see the ones that like, let's say your, your manufacturer like Acer or Asus, uh, may have put or Dell may have put on there. Um, everything in the uh, if you open your start menu, you see like the first four sections: create, explore, and I think the other two. Uh, you'll see a whole bunch of things that um, that are standard in all Windows installations now. So uh, unless you get like Enterprise Edition, so you'll see Bubble Witch Saga and Candy Crush Soda Saga and Asphalt Eight and You'll see, uh, you'll see the Plex, Plex Media software, and you'll see, um, you know, you'll see Drawboard PDF editor, or at least a link to download it from the uh, from the apps from the Windows Store, and you'll see a whole so all together all of the the things that they're trying to get you to do, which include a lot of really chintzy casual games like Candy Crush Soda Saga. Um, are you know are put there by Microsoft and standard on every computer, on even if you get Signature Edition. On top of that, depending on which laptop you get from which manufacturer, you could have another 
you know, five to ten pieces of software installed, which could include trial antivirus software uh, and include, um, which is banned from Signature Edition at least, and could include uh, more casual games, other, uh, and, you know, services that you may or may not uh, be using already, like Amazon and Netflix. Um, and uh, so you have all this in your start menu, and let's face it, it's annoying. But is it so bad that it should change your decision on what laptop to buy or what computer to buy? Should you, you know, tear your hair out over it? No. This is very simple. Uninstall the software. I know that that sounds kind of flippant of me to say, just like just uninstall it. You will the average person now buys a new computer, whether it's laptop or desktop, no more than like every four years. Something like that. I mean, you may end up buying other ones for other members of your family or something like that. But, you know, you're not buying a new computer every day. You're buying, you know, unless you're in an IT department in a business, which in that case, if you buy one with the Windows Enterprise, uh, then you, you can avoid this stuff. But, you know, you you don't have to do you don't have to do this process every day. It will take you maybe five minutes, maybe ten minutes at the outside to uninstall all the unwanted stuff when you turn on your computer. Now, that doesn't make it a wonderful experience, but there's a reason that it's there, and the reason is that Microsoft and your laptop manufacturer, they're getting paid. We don't know how much because these things are very tightly, uh, these secrets are very tightly guarded. You know, we don't know whether they're getting paid for every computer that it's on or just for installate, just for upgrades and usage and whatever. But we know that somehow, somewhere, this stuff is defraying part of the cost of your computer. Margins are very tight. You know, manufacturers don't make a huge profit now on on PCs. And if they were to suddenly stop including bloatware or Microsoft would suddenly stop including bloatware somewhere, somebody, probably the consumer would have to pay extra. Uh, A few years ago, many years ago, almost 10 years ago, Sony had a program with the Vios, Vio laptops that it sold called Fresh Start. And you could pay 50 bucks more to order your Vio without crapware, without bloatware. So, you know, would it be $50 today? I don't know. We do, but uh, maybe it would be ten dollars. Who who knows? But whatever that amount is, unless you get paid a lot of money for your time, you know, maybe if you're a lawyer that makes five hundred dollars an hour, maybe it would be worth it for you to spend an extra fifty bucks on your laptop, not to not to spend five minutes on installing things. But I think for the rest of us, where we're not getting paid for that five minutes, I would rather take the little small annoyance of uninstalling that stuff once every few years uh, then then have to pay extra for my pay extra for my computer not to have it I totally yeah. agree uh, uh, Best Buy used to offer a service at a uh, from Geek Squad where they would remove all of the stuff for you and I don't think they offer that service anymore because people just I think especially with like what generally comes on Windows 10, especially the stuff from Microsoft. Like when we, when we put your new computer in over here, um, it came with uh, Microsoft Clean, right? So it's not a signature edition, but it's it was Microsoft Clean. It was it didn't they the manufacturer didn't put anything extra on, um, right. and you know uninstalling stuff that comes from the store is stupid easy compared to, you know, the old days of having to go into the programs and find, but even that, find the thing and do the uninstall and does it all go away? Well, if it's Norton, no. You know, all of that stuff, you know, there were annoyances in that. That e- today, even that has gone away, which makes the process even easier to uninstall. Yeah, I mean, look... Do we, you know, in a perfect world, you wouldn't have any of this stuff. I do think the most annoying thing with in bloatware is the uh, is the stuff that's like your trialware antivirus, because mm-hmm. a lot of people don't know better 
that, you know, look, there's first of all, there's free antivirus options that you can download. Second of all, there's Windows Defender, which is built into Windows and is free. Granted, it doesn't get as high marks for protecting you as, uh, you know, as some of these paid programs do. But, you know, you end up with like a 30 or 60 day trial on there and then it keeps nagging you to upgrade. And somebody like my mom might not know better and, you know, they might spend the money. So, you know, it's uh, I think that might be the most annoying thing. But, yes. you know, the days when you used to open up your browser and have all kinds of crazy toolbars and things like that, <laughs> you know, which is what they're basically talking about when they say the signature edition has no toolbars and whatever. You know, we can that that's over like and even doesn't when even it was have that capability anymore. No, it doesn't. So, you know, I, I think I, you know, I think, you know, as, as we get in laptops every day and I hear from my uh, coworkers every day. Oh, man, look at all the bloatware on this thing. And they're not wrong. Like some of these things come with a lot of bloatware. Like Acer is a huge offender. Like we get. Like, we were looking at Acer Swift 3 the other day, and it had, like, 10 pieces of bloatware on top of all the Microsoft ones. Uh, nevertheless, you know, when it comes to, when push comes to shove, who cares? Just uninstall it, you know? I'm sorry to say that. Like, you know, sure, if it's me and I had to do this 50 times a day, you know, 10 times a week, I'd be annoyed. But, and, and we, you know, to ba benchmark things, we uninstall the, the, the antivirus software that's on it. So you know, the, the trial where, so that's annoying to us. But if you're buying every computer, every couple of years, just take the 10 minutes. I mean, there's so many things you have to do when you buy a new computer, you know, it's like you buy a new car. Are you going to be upset because there's plastic wrap on the seats and there's like, you know, some, some white paper over the, the, like on the floor that you have to take off and throw away. Like that's just, you know, that's part of getting a new thing, right? Like, are you going to be upset? You, you get your laptop, the packaging has styrofoam in it, and you got to, like, wipe the styrofoam off of stuff? Like, you know, it's an annoyance, but it's it's a part of life, you know? Uh, so, speaking of parts of life, uh, here here is a laptop that I'm reviewing right now. I just wanted to share this with the audience so they could actually see some hardware on here. I'm going to have a visual show and tell. Uh, this right here is... Uh, Oh, hey, this right here is the Asus Zenbook. I forgot that I was watching uh, an episode of Star Trek on here. Anyway, uh, this is the Asus Zenbook uh, UX430. Um, Featuring the back of Shatner. <laughs> that's actually not Shatner. No, I, it's I, not? To be honest, to be honest, okay. okay, I shouldn't admit this, but I was uh, doing some catch up on Star Trek today and I was watching Star Trek Continues. Have you heard uh, of that? Yes, absolutely. So this is actually, yep, if I, you want to not call it Star Trek, it's this Star Trek Continues web series, which is actually really good, <laughs> in, my, in my humble opinion. And, and I was watching on this because the screen is so nice. Uh, the screen of this is, um, is uh, get, reproduces like 133% of the sRGB color gamut. Things are very bright and vibrant. Uh, you know, and when you're watching something that at least is trying to emulate the... Uh, Technicolor or whatever of the 60s TV show, sure. it really stands out on this on this screen. Um, so this thing is is nice. It's really lightweight. It's 2.78 pounds for a 14 inch laptop. That's pretty good. The battery life is eight hours and 40 minutes on our test, so pretty decent. Not you know that's about average for a 14 inch notebook these days. Uh, the keyboard is kind of a mixed bag. It it has uh, good feedback, but I found the A key on this unit at least that I'm testing is a little stiff. Uh, so it slowed it so it caused me to make a few more errors than I normally would. Uh, but uh, it's got a good array of ports here. You see it's got an SD card slot. It's got a uh, regular USB on the other side. It's got a USB C and it's got more US uh, regular USB. However, it cannot charge over the USB C. So that's a downer, um, you know, but uh, it's got a nice, it's nice metallic design. It uh, costs, uh, it's got a core, oh, I forgot the kind of important part. It's got an eighth generation Core i7 processor inside and uh, 512, I think it's a 512 gigabyte uh, SSD. Nice. Five, so maybe it's a 256. Okay. It's got a fast, speedy SSD. It's got a Core, core i7 processor. Uh, 
and all this for for 1050 uh and it weighs very little so uh so a really nice a really nice laptop my review of it will probably up be up on monday on laptop mag and i just wanted everyone to get a, a little preview here of this uh, asus zenbook ux 430 uh which is which is pretty cool now it has some pretty stiff competition in the premium laptop space no doubt uh the dell xps 13 last that i reviewed recently lasts for 16 hours on a charge weighs about the same as this uh and is a little bit smaller but the you know the screen is not quite as colorful on that uh and some may prefer a 14 inch system and and actually uh when the dell is not on sale this is this is a couple hundred dollars cheaper so uh so that's uh just kind of a quick look at that so i encourage everyone to check out my article on Blowware on laptopmag.com and our review of uh, the Asus Zenbook UX430, which is coming up. And we also just posted a review of the new HP Spectre 13, which also have a, has 8th Gen Core. It's a big uh, time for us with 8th Gen Core. We're getting a lot of laptops to refresh with 8th Gen Core CPUs right now. That's cool. Have you guys gotten the uh, refreshed uh, Razer Blade Stealth? Uh... Because I'm, I'm super I'm not, excited to hear I'm, about that one. Mm, I th- we might have, we we might have. I have to. I'll I'll check on that and get back to you. We we might have. Okay. I'm 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 always curious to hear your take on things. Um. So I'm yeah. I'm ex- I, I, I'm excited I, about I this one. I guarantee that I guarantee that we will have a review of that shortly if we don't have it in the office right now. I guarantee we'll have it. We'll have it shortly. We have a great relationship with Razer. They're sending us stuff. They're sending us stuff all the time, and usually on, on par with other with other things. Uh, so, you know, I know that we'll be reviewing that soon. I know that we'll be reviewing the H. Now that we've done this, the Spectre 13, we're supposed to be getting the the NV 13 nice. and the Spectre X3, the new Spectre X360 13 inch. Uh, and I also, uh, you know, it's hope. You know, I don't have this for a fact, so. Let's let's say it's a fact, but I hope at some point soon we'll be able to also, you know, review the the Surface Book. Um, you know, I, Microsoft usually sends us the stuff, so you know we'll we'll hope to be hope to be able to talk about that soon. Nice. Well, I look forward to uh to seeing it, and uh, I appreciate seeing the uh, the Asus there. This week's Extra Life on F5 Live is proudly powered by Razer. All the uh, accessories that you could possibly need to step up your uh, game are available from Razer, whether it be the new uh, Razer Blade Stealth, um, available with an 8th gen Intel Core i7 processor, or the newly announced Razer phone, a it is a phone for gamers, but not a phone for gaming necessarily. Although the specs on it would certainly uh, make it a gaming phone. Uh, a Snapdragon 835 with eight gigs of RAM. It is definitely a phone that'll be able to uh, to do any of the games you want. Plus, if you're looking for uh, accessories to make your PC gaming experience better, they've got keyboards and mice and webcams and all of the things that will make your experience better and you can find all of those products by going to f5live.tv slash razor i want to get my hands on a razor phone just putting that out there razor if you're listening to me tonight uh anyway uh this weekend was uh, BlizzCon, and a lot of things were announced, but there was one that was a bit of a surprise for me. Uh, a Not quite a new product, kind of an old product that they're calling World of Warcraft Classic. It is essentially a uh, server configuration, and uh, 
that allows players to play the game as it existed at launch. Uh, we don't know exactly the rules on how this will work. What we do know is that um, the pirate versions of this feature that have been out there have literally run original server configurations, and um, most of them have required that you have non-patched uh, versions of the game. So you get your original CDs or DVDs, you install the game fresh, you connect to these servers, and you don't get the updates because... The update server isn't there. Um, with with Blizzard bringing this feature official, we don't know exactly what it'll look like, whether or not it'll use original game assets or more modern game assets, because, of course, the graphics of the game over the last 13 years have gotten better. Um, not You know, they're not breathtaking, but, you know, from an MMO, there's certain things that are and are not possible. Uh, so, um, the graphics have definitely improved over the 13 years. So we don't know that we don't know when the game will come out, uh, or what will be required, whether you'll have to purchase a new version of the install, or if it'll just be a collection of servers that you can connect to. We, d we simply don't know what we do know is that Blizzard has definitely bought into the idea that there are people who still want to play, uh, the older version of the game. And this is a thing that we've talked about a number of times, not just necessarily that a game evolves over time, which is certainly one of the, the things that we have here, but that in modern gaming, the the developers, the, the publishers have a huge expense to keep certain features of the game running. And at a certain point, they don't want to do it anymore. Um, you know, electronic arts, uh, we got mad a number of years ago because EA uh, closed up a game, a social game. It was a SimCity Social. And they just, bloop, it went away one night. That was it. Bye-bye. And, and like, but, but I had, not me, but um, speaking from a general terms, right? I had spent money on that game. Well, sad story. It's gone. Um, that that's kind of a, a thing now, right? It's an annoyance that exists. There's all kinds of things that when the publisher decides I don't want to be part of it anymore, boop, it goes away. Um, and it's nice to see that Blizzard is recognizing that there are people who don't necessarily want that scenario, who would like to continue to play. I'd, I'd like to see more companies, EA, if you're listening, um, allow us access to older games either officially or unofficially it, i i like this yeah you know the cloud-based world that we live in today has no respect for history um because when you think about it wasn't there some kind of a movement a while ago to actually create like a national archive or something mm -hmm. of of video games and and uh, video game servers because the server part, I think, is particularly key because things that play offline seem to, you know, there seems to always be a way to get those. Sure. You know, like maybe not necessarily in the original hardware format, like, you know. Right. But you, there's it you seems might use like it, almost you might use it in an emulator or something like that. Yeah. But... It seems like every single almost every single game that you can think of, whether legally or somewhat illegally is available for download somewhere, somewhere in the ROM. Sure. You know, so, you know, a lot of people, there's a lot of people who have done a lot of great things to keep the history of, of, uh, regular, you know, offline video games alive. Sure. Look at, look but, at, uh, Microsoft doing backwards compatibility on the Xbox one, all the way back to the original Xbox now. Yep. And for that reason, for that, for that reason, uh, honestly, the next video game system I get would probably be an Xbox rather than a PlayStation. Uh, because I have a PlayStation three now and I'm not, you know, it's very unappealing to me to buy a four and then be like, Oh yeah, all the games you bought are, are now useless. Yeah. You've got to uh, keep the three hooked up, you know, it, yeah, it's, it's ludicrous. Yeah. Whereas, you know, Xbox, uh, keeps that compatibility. So it makes me, uh, think much more favorably of, of Microsoft's platform. And the Nintendo, uh, the Nintendo switch has an NES emulator built into it. Yeah, but aside, all of that aside, um, you know, I think cloud-based games are the biggest, 
the biggest challenge. Like my wife had a great um, personal sadness, disappointment, because the MMO that she played, they closed it down. Oh. Uh, and it was like her, it was like she made so many friends through it. It was such a big, she played this game. They closed down like several years ago now called City of Heroes. Yep. And that was her big game. She loved City of Heroes. You know, she made a lot of friends through that. People she's still friendly with today, likes people she met in real life and things like that. And the, one day the publisher of the game decided this game's not profitable enough for us. We're closing it down. Yep. And nobody else could could do it or whatever. They wouldn't part with the code or whatever. So, like, they, they shut it down. No more City of Heroes. And, you know, that's really sad because there's no other... You know, if you buy like a, you know, if you buy a Parcheesi game when you're five years old, you expect that unless unless like it, it rots or it catches fire, you'll sure. be able to play it. Right. You know, play it when you're 40 years old, you know. But if you buy, a, you know, if you start using these this cloud based stuff, you know, it's here today, gone tomorrow. There's right. no way that you could count on it to always be there or aspects of a game that are. um aspects of a game that live in the cloud that sort of hobble it without it. Like, yeah. you know, my son and I got really into playing Disney infinity, mm -hmm. uh, cause he, he loved that game and you could still play, like we knew when we got it, it was discontinued, you know, and you could still play it, but all of the like DLC that existed and like stuff shared from the community, which apparently was like a lot of great stuff, no longer available. So, so like, you know, and then I think somewhere there's somebody trying to set up a server of that. But it is a shame that like because you need the cloud, so much great stuff is lost to time. So yeah. it's nice of Blizzard to do this. I wish more companies would find a way of of archiving old experiences. Yeah, allow us allow us as a as a group to rent a server or you know, whatever. Put it put it into Azure, allow us to spin up a server ourselves then you never have to even worry about it you know there there are ways to do it but yeah it's it's sad that it doesn't happen but it's nice to see blizzard responding to uh input from the community we would like to play the original wow okay it's yeah. it's been several years and cease and desist letters from blizzard before they've <laughs> bought into the concept but um, they've, they have embraced it and, uh, it'll be nice to see how they do it. It'll be, it'll be interesting if they use modern assets. Um, we know that they don't have the original hardware anymore. Um, they auctioned the original wow servers uh, a while back, so they don't have the original hardware. So it'll be a new install of the, of the servers for sure. So it's possible they may just set up a new scenario that the modern game can connect to a version of the server that'll limit you back to the original gameplay, which would be interesting to see. But you know, it's easy for them though because they're still the same company, and their and their franchise is still very successful. They're mostly the same company. They weren't Activision at the time, but yeah, it's <laughs> they've got. I mean, but they have more resources today than they did before the Activision buyout. So right. they're actually in a better position today than five years ago to accomplish this goal. Right. They're still in business. And, and you know, look, when something is a successful franchise like that, there's always impetus to to, to do classic things with sure. it. Sure, yeah. Right. Yeah, we see, you know, Mario do classic stuff all the time. The, the new Mario Odyssey goes 2D. You know, there's... <laughs> they're... they're Doing classic stuff like that inside of a modern environment is is a popular thing right now. So that's why I think maybe they'll do it in the modern engine, but use the original limitations, which would be interesting. That and the fact that Blizzard has admitted that they've lost original assets from other games, so it wouldn't be a surprise if they've actually they do not own the original assets anymore. <laughs> which would be kind of interesting. Anyway. We have no idea a release on this, so uh, it is other than, hey, it's coming, there's no gameplay, there's no nothing. It is all speculation, but it's nice to see this trend starting.
This week's news from the tubes on F5 Live is proudly powered by Rift Tracks. Make fun of movies or let the professionals do it because that's what they get paid for. The guys who used to do Mystery Science Theater 3000 are back and doing what they do best, making fun of movies. From blockbusters to Merlin the Return, they've got a little bit of everything. The way it usually works is for a couple of bucks, you download the MP3 either on your computer or your phone, play it along with your DVD, Netflix, Amazon, wherever the movie happens to to exist, and laugh. Uh, They also do live events, which they are complete with for 2017, and uh, we'll be announcing their 2018 lineup hopefully soon. Um, If their 2018 lineup is half as good as 2017, it will be worth going to see for sure. Um, to find out all of the movies that are available and the short films, they just published a new one, I think, today, uh, you can go to f5live.tv slash tracks with an X. All right. So, obviously, Avram and I have talked a number of times about the problems with the patent system today. Any of the problems that exist today are nothing compared to the problems in the 90s when if you could string any eight words together that sounded techy, you could probably patent it so long as it was software based. Um, and what a number of those patents have been around for a long time. Yahoo, uh, Avery and I were talking before, Yahoo had a number of them that were painfully vague. Um, I think they had a patent that was like, Having a button that allows you to buy something. Like, it, stupidly vague patents. Well, doesn't Amazon still have the patent on uh, one-click shopping? Yes, they do. Because no <laughs> one could have possibly thought that people might want to <laughs> only click once. Right. Um, so, one of the patents that has been uh, kind of floating around for a couple of decades is currently referred to as the podcast patent. And that's because the wording is incredibly vague, as most of them were, and could potentially describe podcasts. For example, I think the wording is something to the effect of a unique URL that allows you to download a series of media files. Well, that's not just podcast, that's Netflix. Like that, (laughs) that's that's any API uh, on the planet. But... The company that uh, currently owns the patent, and to be fair, has for 21 years, but they are the third owner of said patent, uh, Personal Audio LLC, decided to um, file uh, or to send cease and desists or, or threatening letters at the very least to a number of people, including Adam Carolla, which I thought was <laughs> wonderfully stupid. Because that guy is not going to be quiet about it, and he wasn't. And uh, so, uh, a number of a number of big shows, including some people that uh, we know, received some of these letters. And um, so, to the rescue came the electronic, what is it? The Electronic Freedom Foundation, the EFF? Frontier Foundation. That's it. Electronic, electronic Frontier Foundation. Front, Frontier, yeah. Um, they came to our rescue and they filed a uh, a motion to disband the patent to invalidate it. It, it like in twenty early twenty fifteen late twenty fourteen something like that. It's been going on for a while now. Uh, they have had win after win after win in court after court after court. They uh, in August they had what should have been their final win. Uh, in federal court, in the appellate court. But being the fun company that they are, Personal Audio um, filed for um, for a process called, I don't know how to pronounce it because all of this stuff is in Latin, let's say en banc, E-N-B-A-N-C, which essentially means uh, we don't trust this one judge in the appellate court we want the entire appellate court to hear it. <sighs> so all of the judges have to come together and hear the case one last time. And uh, in, in this particular case, uh, personal audio didn't just argue in favor of their patent. They actually argued against 
the validity of um, the legality of inter parts review process, which essentially is the ability for um, a group to come together as a group to try and invalidate a patent because they felt that that put the that tilted the scales the wrong way. The uh, the judges disagreed, and um, in a very short two page uh, statement said, uh, "Go away." So <laughs> the podcast patent is dead. Hooray for the EFF! I have a very weird relationship, like emotional relationship with them. But hooray for the EFF on this particular topic. I, I, I don't have any mixed feelings with the EFF. I mean, everything I've seen them do, I agreed with. Uh, I, maybe I'm not aware of everything. I've but, been uh, annoyed by a couple of their initiatives. But in general, yeah, I like the everybody's everybody should offer an open version of their Wi-Fi router. No, I, no, no, thank you. I don't have a strong feeling about that one, but but I but I I appreciate like this is you know I mean this is a serious impediment yeah. to to commerce like that somebody can basically run a protection racket mm-hmm. on that that sort of thing. I mean it's a similar. I mean so do you remember uh, I think it was British Telecom that had the uh, patented the idea of a link. Yeah, and they wanted everyone to pay them a license for every <laughs> link they put on their website like. Holy cow, that's, you know, I mean, like, and, and that's you have the to, end of the internet right there. Like, you have to wonder, when when that idea was floated around in in their office, and they're like, you know what, what great idea I've got. Let's try to license every link on every website ever. How, how in the world did anybody go not be like, um, that is not possible. We... Well, we couldn't, put we couldn't do in, it if we wanted to. I mean, who knows who they would have gone after with that? Sure. You know, they. I think they did go after some of the larger companies first to see if they could get them to pay. To test Maybe the waters. Maybe they try to make the ISP pay. Maybe, like, there's so many different so many different pockets that they could have their hand out to. And, and eventually, you know, eventually they could have you know, everybody who runs any kind of website could be paying them a tax, basically. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, obviously, they would love to do that. Uh, but, of course, the risk know. the risk you run when you start going after people for, uh, for a perceived patent infringement is the eventual invalidation of said patent. Okay, well, you know what? First of all, I mean, I'm going to go out of limb here and I'm going to say I think obviously what these patents are doing is is wrong. Mm-hmm. Like it's it's it, it like, you know, but these companies are not thinking about wrong and right. They're thinking about the bottom line. Sure. And from their perspective, the amount that they could get from getting all this patent licensing money is bizarrely uh, huge, is so big that it's worth them to pay for lawyers to intimidate people. Sure. And. The smaller the people they go after, the more likely they are to get their kickback. To just write a check. Because, because the cost of bought paying a lawyer to defend you Way higher. Is, pro- is prohibitive. So it's prohibitive and uncertain. Like you pay a lawyer to defend you, you might lose anyway. Then you're going to spend a, lose a lot. Like, okay, you asked me for this money. I guess I'm going to give it to you because I can't afford to, I can't afford to fight you in court. Uh, so that's why having a, a class act... Uh, you know, whatever they call it, I guess in this case, the class action uh, from somebody like the EFF is so is so important because yeah. you can't most a lot of people can't do it for themselves. Great. You know, Apple and Samsung can fight it out about whether or not sure. rounded corners on a phone <laughs> or something are, are patentable because they have enough money uh, to pay the lawyers for it to, to sort of stand up for themselves. Sure. But if you're trying to start a business or you're in a small business and you just want to make a device with round corners, you can't afford this kind of litigation. Right. That's what makes this completely unfair because it makes it, 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 it only a large business can prevail in this type of situation because only they can afford the lawyers. Which is obviously why um, the, the court told them to go away when they tried to argue against 
the inter part review process. <laughs> Because right. obviously it's designed specifically for that scenario, for little guys. Like, if if they had eventually come after us, we don't generate enough revenue off of this to to be able to pay a lawyer to, to try and defend that. I mean, granted, a, a group would have probably come together anyway behind the scenes. <laughs> But, you know, th this is why this kind of system exists and why the judges basically said, get out of our court. So it's definitely a, it's definitely a win. Thank you to the EFF for fighting it. Uh, it's definitely at this point, it's it's probably going to go down as their as one of their most important like consumer wins because it's it's a big deal for a lot of people, um, not just. Not just you and I who do this regularly, but you know anybody, anybody who just does it out of a closet by themselves, talking into their sweaters. You know, it's well. I'll, I'll go further. It's a big one for people who listen to podcasts. Yes, because do you want your choices to be limited? I mean, do you only want to be able right. to listen to a podcast from from large media companies? Right. Exactly. Exactly, because obviously, if if this had gone the wrong way, and I'm going to say that that it would have been the wrong way, um, then you know all those little guys, even including ourselves, would have would have dried up, and the only people who could have kept doing it are those that uh that could afford to pay the licensing fee, which is insane. So, thank you, EFF. This week's DRM not included on F5 Live is proudly powered by Amazon Prime. We all know about free shipping, but what you may or may not know about is all of the other stuff that comes along with Prime, including Amazon Prime Music, which offers uh, several million songs available to stream for free as part of your subscription and a discount on um, the, the full Amazon Music. Amazon Prime Video, which gives a ridiculous amount of content available to stream uh, included, plus the ability to add HBO and Showtime and a bunch of other channels. So if you're not a uh, if you're not a uh, cable subscriber, you can still get these uh, services all in one place. But for me, one of the things that I like is uh, Twitch Prime, the ability to have one free subscription every month, um, which which uh, helps out your uh, your favorite streamers. And uh, that's not all. There's lots of other uh, features available. And you can find out all of those features. And if you're not already a subscriber, get a 30-day free trial by going to f5live.tv slash Amazon. Okay. So this topic we're going to try and be careful on because Avram and I tend to stay away from... Uh, inflammatory topics, but we're going to talk about uh, something interesting that happened uh, seemingly as we were on the air last week. Um, uh, Anthony Rapp, who is in Star Trek Discovery, which we were discussing last week, who is somebody that I I know, full disclosure, somebody that I know, um, accused Kevin Spacey of I don't know exactly where it falls. I would probably put it under the assault category um, when Anthony was 14. And um, it's obviously not the first of these that we've had. Um, in fact, it was interesting because right after the show last week, you and I discussed a different incident that had happened last week, um, which was uh, Robert Scoble. And of course... Before that, we all know Harvey Weinstein. Um, the the thing that I have found interesting, the two things. One has been the strangely bizarre responses from the people being accused. Weinstein 
uh, said, well, I came up in the industry in the 60s and behavior in the office was different then. Okay, that's weird. And then Robert Scoble said, well, the women didn't work for me, so it's not harassment, which is weird. And then Kevin Spacey said, tried to deflect the whole thing by coming out as gay on Twitter. Like, oh, it's almost like there's a PR agency who's out there specifically telling these people, be, be weird. But, but that's not the real topic that I wanted to talk about. The real topic has been the swift and decisive actions from the companies that they work for. Harvey Weinstein was fired from the company that bears his name. Robert Scoble was almost immediately terminated by the venture capital firm that he founded. And um, Spacey was immediately terminated from Netflix, including um, a film that he produced and starred in titled Gore, which was fully filmed in post-production they have thrown the film away. And they have put the final season of House of Cards on hiatus until they can figure out how to finish the season without Kevin Spacey. Which I find, like, from like from a business perspective, right? Uh, House of Cards is one of Netflix's AAA titles. Like, it's it's one of their their big things. And it's refreshing to see that they were not afraid to go we don't care about one of our top shows as much as we care about this topic done well netflix is definitely very averse to is very careful cautious i would say when it comes to doing something that might uh might be seen as um offensive so I think, you know, I, I applaud them actually, you know, I applaud them doing what they did with him. Absolutely. Um, because it's it's clear that it's clear that not only was he, you know, it, did he do or, well, we don't know. It. I want to say he did it. But not only is he under a lot of allegations yeah. that sound credible. Uh, and more, but, more than one involving a minor. It was also alleged that he's doing this on the set of the show. Uh huh. So and the film. So what I don't know is whether they like Netflix is sponsoring it, but I don't know if they are the production company or not. MRC. You, but you know, I don't know that you want to support an employer who creates a quote a, a hostile work environment. Right. Right. Uh, this is all really interesting. To the, 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 it's in interesting to me. Well, I don't know. Interesting. I don't know what word to use. I, it's, yeah. it's, it's coincidental that I happen to have, and most people at my company happen to have been, had taken a harassment, uh, prevention workshop, uh, like a couple of weeks before these things started coming out. So it's just, we, uh, you know, like it wasn't me. I, w I wasn't forced to take one because me like everybody, you know, a lot of companies right. do this. We were asked to take an online course and we had to complete it. Sure. It's not um, it's not like diversity training on the office because Michael Scott made a joke. <laughs> oh, I, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, they I, we're, we're all asked to do these things. Uh, so anyway, uh, it's not the first time, actually. I think we had to do a few years ago, too. A anyway. So it's funny because, you know, when I heard Scoble say something like, oh, you can't harass someone unless they work for you. I was like, well, he I really would like to send him the link to this online course because yeah. they say that right away. Yeah, that you that uh, you can be you can harass someone whether you work for them or with them or not. So um, anyway, uh, the Spacey thing, I mean, uh, Netflix is very cautious because not only did they do this with Kevin Spacey, which seems very well, well founded to me, but they were also very cautious about seeming insensitive with, uh, the Punisher, um, in a way that seemed a little, a little strange to me, but I guess there's, there was a point to where they pulled the Punisher, uh, 
you know, they've been very cagey about releasing the Punisher and publicizing the Punisher. And then they pulled the Punisher uh, panel from New York Comic Con because there had been a mass shooting earlier in the week. Um, you know, so I think Netflix is very concerned about seeming insensitive, insensitive to things. Mm-hmm. For sure. You know? And, and uh, you and I were talking a little bit before the show about the, the, the contrast in how Hollywood is responding to these things today versus like take Kevin Spacey and compare him to Roman Polanski from the seventies um, who only had one accusation and fled the country over it even after the studios came to his defense to try and shut down the accusations. In this case, the studios are like, no, get out. We're... Nope. It's, And I, I think it has a lot to do with the fact that the technology industry is so, like the modern technology industry is so heavily involved in Hollywood, like Netflix, for example, right? They're more of a tech company. Internally, they're more of a tech company than they are a, a media company, right? Um, obviously the product that comes out to the world is, is media, but in general, they're a a tech company founded by tech, you know, internally kind of founded by tech people. So that might explain the, the very different responses just a couple of decades apart on very similar accusations. Here's, here, here's what I, why, I mean, I'm no expert on this, and so on, sure. on why on why the zeitgeist of our time is different today. I mean, I obviously think hope that we would have made some advancements in how we view uh, things like sexual assault and sexual harassment in the last forty years. I hope that we're more enlightened about these things and take them more seriously today than people did in the seventies. But um, you know, despite some some things that maybe are not so enlightened go, that sometimes happen today, but you know, I also think social media has, is playing a role in this uh, because what we're seeing now is a lot of um, the people who were affected by, um, you know, a lot of the people who have a story to tell about Harvey Weinstein or a story to tell about Brett Ratner or a story to tell about Scoble or a story to tell about um, about Spacey they're now able to go on social media or there's many different publishing outlets for them, you know, like sure. medium and things like that, or, or other outlets that are, or other like proactive news outlets that are trying to get the story like Buzzfeed sure. um, that are out there. And, you know, I think that Buzzfeed, um, Buzzfeed being behind, I think both uh, Scoble and Spacey. Yeah. And, and I think so there, there, there's a lot of great journalism going on, people trying to break, that kind of news. Mm-hmm. Then once the news breaks out and other people who've been affected get comfortable, yeah. some of them are quite, quite, you know, famous in their own right. Right. So you're, you know, y- you got to respect, you know, I mean, I think you should respect everybody who makes such an accusation, but, um, I mean, I think people respect like, Hey, th- you know, Rose McGowan, we've been watching her for years and she says, this is a problem. And, mm-hmm. you know, like, yeah. so I think a lot of people are using their platform to say this, ha- their platform who have, who are famous and have a platform to say that these things happen to them. And so, you know, you're seeing it on social media. Mm-hmm. Companies like Netflix are very social media savvy. They see not, they see the tremendous retweets and follows that these things get. They, they, they don't want to be, they don't want to be become, uh, they don't want, Netflix stop this to become viral. Right. They don't want to be the news, right? So, you know, we could say that they're doing it because they're enlightened and they know how terrible this is, uh, that Spacey probably did these things. You know, we don't know, but he's very accused by many people of doing these things. Um, but, uh, and, and we could say that, but, they also have a you know a reputation to maintain, sure. and this this is toxic to their to their brand. To their brand, yeah. So so you know, I don't know that it's. I don't think we can say necessarily that they're doing this out of the goodness of their 
their heart or something. Sure. I mean, you know, I have no beef with Netflix. They're fine company as far as I'm concerned. You know, I, but but at the same time, I mean, I think there's a, a smart business sense for them in, in not in backing away from this as quickly as possible because sure. it's bad for them. Absolutely. And, and it's good for them and it's good for them to look decisive in, in in getting rid of him. So the optics of this are good for Netflix. Absolutely. Like not the optics of Spacey Dewey, but the optics of them uh-huh. being decisive. Right. Uh are, are good for Netflix. Now for sure. I don't I don't believe that I'm not sure that this movie will be shelved forever. If it's been filmed if it's been filmed and they don't haven't like deleted all the files I'm sure someday, somewhere, if like, you know, the heat of this comes off or what, like people, um, you know, I don't know, it, people, Spacey doesn't do it. For, I, I don't know. I, no, I, you know, I don't know what. But sure. at some point, you don't know what possible, conditions. At some point, it is possible that people will decide, hey, we're going to, you know, we're still going to, um, you know, we're going to have an outlet to see this and maybe it won't be netflix that does it but uh and i don't know i mean a movie about the the life of gore vidal i don't know how exciting that is anyway but um didn't really excite me but um you know they spent money on it so it's possible i mean on the other hand you could join the ranks of all the movies that have been shelved you know you could join the ranks of the fantastic four movie that roger corman made or whatever like you know but what is kind of sad about these things, or I don't know if it's sad, it's just kind of, you know, like, okay, so if you like you, if you like this person's work, it's like, well, you know, now it does kind of cast a, a pall over everything that you might have enjoyed that they did. Right. You know? Yeah. Uh, but, you know, that's their own fault. That's their own behavior. Like, if they're doing those sorts of things, they shouldn't be, you know, they shouldn't be having the opportunity to ha- to be making money off of new shows and movies on Netflix. Sure. People don't want to see them because it reminds them of what they did. Um, I mean, I think maybe Roman Polanski benefits from the fact not only that, you know, what he did was a long time ago uh, and people have forgotten, some people have neglected it, but also because he's behind the camera and so people are looking at him. Sure. Uh, but you know nevertheless you know maybe now that some of these allegations have you know started maybe now that there's a certain you know energy toward like calling these sorts of people out maybe maybe people will start to shun uh polanski maybe will people will start to shun some of the folks who have been accused of this stuff in the past that's possible um you know uh so yeah i mean i good for netflix but on the other hand I, I think that what they did was also smart business. Sure. Yeah. It it wasn't just, but it was it was smart business because of a, a change in general perception. You know, if if the public didn't have an outrage over it, it wouldn't necessarily have been smart business. But in this case, they've they recognized that it was a. It was a, a toxic situation. Got themselves out of it. It's good for them. It's good for their image. It's it's just a generally smart move. What concerns me though is that people have unfortunately the public, or at least the people think that the public has a short memory uh, for things like this. So uh, I, I haven't kept track of all the vicissitudes of it, but you know when all those accusations came out against Bill Cosby. At one point, a whole bunch of stations that were showing Cosby Show reruns pulled the show, Mm -hmm. and then slowly but surely it started to come back on on the air. Nothing about his reputation had changed. It just wasn't in in the daily news anymore. Right. You know, so could the same thing happen with with Kevin Spacey? Sure. You know? Yeah, for sure. It could. Well, that is our show. The intent, obviously, was not to end on a weird note, but (laughs) sometimes it's what happens. Um, Thank you to those of you who joined us live. Um, 
we always appreciate our live viewers. If you weren't able to join us live, that is okay. You can always subscribe by going to plugitlive.com slash subscribe. Um, a scheduling note. Next week uh, is Anime EY. We do not know exactly what our schedule will look like next week. We are going to try and do uh, the show from there and hopefully be able to do a semi-normal show maybe with um, one or two of the 3000 Brigade cast members uh, in addition we'll see how all that goes it could just end up being a disaster and we just walk away so <laughs> uh, stay tuned on social media we'll definitely keep you updated on uh, on our plans uh, for that um, like I said there will be a new um, Toad Detective episode. It won't be published next week, but it will be uh, recorded next week, so watch out for that as well. And then after that, we will be back uh, on and off through the end of the year based on holidays, because we know holidays um, screw with schedules sometimes. Um, yeah, like Christmas Eve is on Sunday, so that could screw things up. You know, we'll see We'll see how uh, December goes. But I guess on that note, on behalf of the staff that's not here, I'm Scott. I'm Abram. And we might see you back next week, if not uh, back in two. Ciao.